As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. Hey, welcome to today's program. This is Rick Renner. I've been sitting right here waiting for our time together. And today, we're going to return to the subject of dream thieves. Years ago, God called Denise and me and our sons to leave the secure United States where everything was so blessed and relocate to the Soviet Union that was falling to pieces. It was in a shambles. There was a deficit of everything. It was a place of great political turmoil, yet that's what God told us to do, and we obeyed Him. But when we got here, by the way, that's where I'm coming to you from today. This is our studio in Moscow. But when we got here about 30 years ago, there were so many problems that we had to overcome, and God was telling us to launch a TV ministry to the 11 time zones of the former Soviet Union. No one had ever done that. Literally, no one. We were the first. But God said to do it, so we knew that we could do it. He never asks you to do what you cannot do, but you can only do it with His help, with His anointing, and with His wisdom. But we grabbed hold of it, but every day we encountered some kind of new dream thief that came to stop us. And we had to really press through all of those dream thieves. The reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to know the new series which I'm offering you today is based on a book that I wrote in those early times when we first moved to the Soviet Union. So this is not theoretical teaching. This is right out of our life, what we learned about overcoming those dream thieves, which the devil uses to stop us from doing what God has called us to do. And I want you to have the whole series. It's 10 parts. It is so filled with encouragement, comes with a great study guide. And of course, we're offering you my book by the same title. And today I want to read to you from page 91 just to get started. Listen to this. As you stand on your word from God and resolve to do what you need to do to fulfill the divine assignment God has given to you, you need to be aware of another extremely sinister and sneaky enemy that will try to steal the dream from your heart. This wicked foe doesn't come from the devil, nor does it necessarily come from your environment or your friends or your families. It comes from you. I'm talking about neutrality. Oh, my goodness. You know, one time I was being interviewed on a TV program, and the interviewer said, Rick, please tell us, what is the greatest enemy you've had to overcome in your life? And I quickly answered. The interviewer was shocked with my answer. I said, me. I've learned that if I can overcome me, I can do anything that God will ever ask me to do. And my friends, overcoming you will be the greatest thing you'll ever do. If you can overcome you, you can handle anything else in life. And one thing we each have to overcome is neutrality, which comes to... Mm, paralyze us so that we stop moving forward on this race that God has asked us to run. And today we're going to talk about getting beyond neutrality and allowing faith and patience to work together as partners to produce a powerful result in our life. I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. So far, we've seen there are five dream thieves that come to steal the dream of God from our hearts. Number one, time. Time has a way of wearing away at us, telling us just give it up, it's never going to happen. If you make it beyond time, then there's dream thief number two, which is the voice of the enemy, who says you're crazy, you've lost your mind, God never gave you a word, you just made this up. And if you'll listen to him, he'll coax you into letting loose of your calling and your dream. Dream thief number three, the voice of your friends who love you and they don't want you to make a mistake. And when you say you're going to leave security and launch out to do something new, they may try to give you a more balanced perspective to talk you out of it. And if you make it beyond them, then there's the voice of your family. They really love you and they do not want you to make a mistake. And they may try to talk you out of what you're about to do. But if you make it beyond all of them, then you come to dream thief number five, which is neutrality. And this is referred to in 
Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, where the Bible says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. According to this verse, slothfulness will stop us from inheriting the promises of God. Well, what does the word slothful mean? You could actually translate it that you be not neutral. It's the Greek word neothros. It's really where we get the word neutral, and it depicts something that is slow and sluggish, something that's lost its speed or momentum. It conveys the idea of something that has lost the drive, the thrust, the impetus, the pace and speed that it once possessed. The idea of one whose zeal has now dissipated, it denotes a person who's become disinterested and whose zeal has been replaced with a middle of the road, take it or leave it mentality. It carries the idea of one who has a lethargic, lackadaisical, apathetic, indifferent, lukewarm attitude toward life, a non-achiever or a non-achieving attitude. That's what the word slothful means. It does not mean to be lazy. It doesn't even describe a person that's just sitting around. This may be a very active person, but inwardly they've really become neutralized. They've lost their momentum. They've lost their drive. They've lost their passion. This is so terrible that we read an example of it in Revelation chapter 3 verse 15 when Jesus addresses the church of Laodicea. Naturally, they had everything, but inwardly, they were lacking fire. Listen to what Jesus said to them in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. And then Jesus strangely says, I would that thou wert cold or hot. And for years when I read that, it was a little confusing to me because it sounds worse to me to be cold. But yet Jesus said, I would that thou were cold or hot rather than being lukewarm. I know that you're neither cold nor hot. I would that you were one or the other. And then he adds in verse 16, so then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So according to Revelation 3, 15 and 16, it's better to be cold or hot than to be lukewarm. What is Jesus really talking about? Well, the city of Laodicea was in the very middle of the Lycus Valley on a hill. And in the city of Laodicea, there was no natural water source. And it was a very rich city, so they made a decision to transport water through pipes from Colossae, which was just a short distance away, and from Hierapolis. In Colossae, there were cold, refreshing waters that came down from the top of the mountains, and it was a resort city. And during the summers, people would go to Colossae to refresh themselves in the cool, refreshing waters. Over in Hierapolis were hot mineral springs, and people would go there to bathe in those springs because they were hot and they were healing. They were therapeutic. Both of these were good, refreshing waters, healing, and therapeutic waters. But in Laodicea, they had no water. So the Laodiceans, because they were rich, said, hey, here's what we'll do. We will develop the first engineering system of pipes in the history of the world, and we will transport hot water to our city, cold water to our city. No one had ever attempted this before, but the pipes were made out of clay that were filled with minerals. Well, by the time the cold water made it to Laodicea, it had lost its coldness. It was no longer refreshing. By the time the hot healing and therapeutic water made it from Hierapolis to the city of Laodicea, it had lost its therapeutic powers. Now it was lukewarm. It had no temperature at all, nothing special about it. There was no refreshing waters. There were no healing and therapeutic waters. And not only that, because the water had been carried through pipes that had minerals, by the time the water showed up in Laodicea, it had the putrid taste of all of those minerals. And when the people in Laodicea tasted it, it failed their expectations. Ah, they were so excited. This was the first engineering system of its kind. They were waiting to open the vowels to experience the water. And when they tasted it, it was sickening and they spit it out. That is where all this comes from in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, which means Jesus would rather that we be cool and refreshing, or Jesus would rather that we be healing and therapeutic, 
But when he finds us to be lukewarm, we have no temperature whatsoever. He finds it so disgusting in his people that he wants to spit it out. It does not mean that we lose our salvation. It's just repulsive for Jesus to partake of a believer who has become neutral. Now, friends, that makes neutrality very, very serious. But the reason people become neutral is because they get tired. And I want to read to you from my book, Dream Thieves. Listen to this. This word neutral, the word slothful, taken from the Greek word nothros, could be typified by a candle that once burnt brightly, but whose dim flame doesn't shine like it once did. It could describe a person who once very deeply felt something about a certain goal and was wholeheartedly committed to achieving it, but whose passion is no longer what it once was. Previously, this person put all of his time, all of his effort, all of his attention into that cause, but now he doesn't even seem to care about it. His commitment to the dream has become slack. His passion has begun to wear off. And all of these describe a person that is no thrust, a person that is slothful, or a person who's become neutral. It depicts something that is neither hot nor cold, someone who's neither committed or uncommitted, an attitude or mentality that really couldn't care less anymore. And a person in this condition has lost his zeal, his passion and conviction for the vision or goal that once burned so brightly in his heart heart. Wow, that is amazing. And we're told in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36, you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Well, people give up and people become neutral simply because they get tired of waiting and waiting and waiting. But this verse says you have need of patience. The word need, the Greek word krea, it depicts a deficit or a shortage, or a need. It's identifying a need or a deficit. You have a deficit of patience. And the word patience, the Greek word, hupomene, a word which I've covered so many times in the program and will continue to do so in the future because it is so very important. It is the Greek word hupomene, which the early church called the queen of all virtues. They believed if you had this, you would always win. It wasn't a question of if you would win. It was just a question of when your victory would take place. This word patience would be better translated endurance. You have need of endurance. It means to stay or to abide, to remain in your spot, to keep a position, to resolve, to maintain territory that's been gained. And in a military sense, it pictures soldiers who were ordered to maintain their positions even in the face of fierce combat. To defiantly stick it out regardless of pressures mounted against it, it depicts staying power, hanging their power, or I say this word hupomene, here translated patience, which really is the word endurance, means the attitude that holds out, holds on, outlasts, perseveres, hangs in there, never giving up, refusing to surrender, and turning down every opportunity to quit. It pictures one under a heavy load, but who refuses to bend, break, or surrender because he is convinced that the territory promise or principle under assault rightly belongs to him. It can be translated as stamina or durability. Wow. And the Bible says, if you'll stay in faith, if you'll continue to believe, you eventually will receive the promise. And the word receive, the Greek word komizo, which means you're going to receive what you have coming to you. And what you have coming to you is the promise of God. What God has promised is exactly what God is going to do. But Hebrews 6 verse 12 continues to say that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And notice the word through. The word through in Greek is the word dia. It indicates instrumentality, which means there's two instruments that are required for you to do what God has called you to do. There are two instruments that are required for you to receive the promises of God. One is faith and one is patience. You have to have both of these. Just like it takes a man and a woman to produce a child, you have to have faith and patience. Some people say, all you need is faith. But my friends, that is just as ridiculous as a man 
who says, I'm going to have a baby by myself. I really want to have a baby. He's not going to have a baby without a spouse. He's got to have a spouse to sow his seed into. And the two of them together will produce a child. Think how ridiculous it would be for a woman who's never been married. She has no spouse, but she wants to have a baby. She declares she's going to have a baby. That is ridiculous unless you're the Virgin Mary. It takes a man and a woman to produce a child. It takes faith and patience working together to give birth to the promises of God. That word patience, again, the Greek word hupomene, stamina, durability, the ability to hang in there. Faith believes it is an initiator, but it is sown into patience and the two of them together give birth to the promises of God. And the Bible is filled, filled, filled with examples of individuals who had a word from God, but the word did not come to pass quickly. It came to pass over a period of time. They had to have patience as they waited for their due season. And that leads us to Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, which says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, then he adds, if we faint not. But notice he says, let us not be weary. The word weary is the plural word in kakomen. The word in means in. Kakomen means the evil. You compound the two words together. It means to give in or to surrender to that which is evil or bad, which means when you give up and walk away from what God told you to do, God views this as being evil. Don't surrender to the urge to give up. Don't let neutrality get you. You've got to sow your faith into patience and wait. And that's why the rest of the verse says, for in due season. We shall reap. That's a promise. You shall reap in due season if you faint not. What does the word faint mean? It's a form of the Greek word ek luo. The word ek means out. The word luo means to loosen. You compound the two words together. It means to faint, to let go, to loosen up, to relax to lose altogether, to release, to surrender, to grow weary, to give up. It is the image of one who relinquishes his grip on an object or principle because of exhaustion, exasperation, or weariness. It depicts a relaxed mental state that results in loss. It depicts one so weary that he gives up and forfeits what he has long waited for. He was right on the brink of receiving it, but he faints. He loosens his grip. He releases it. He lets it go. And when he does so, he forfeits the thing he was about to receive. Well, in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible tells us, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain upon tablets that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak, it shall not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. People read this and they run into those words an appointed time and realize that sometimes the dream that God gave us doesn't come to pass by tomorrow. It may not come to pass by next week, maybe not even by next year. There is an appointed time, but the Word of God promises, though it tarry, wait for it, don't give up, endure, be patient, because it will surely come, it shall not tarry. And my friend, I speak that to you today. God is not a man that he could lie. He's not the son of man that he changes his mind. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. What God says he's going to do is precisely what he will do. He needs you to embrace the word from God, embrace the call, embrace the dream, and stand by it. And that's why Hebrews 10 verse 23 says, let us hold fast. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Oh, if you don't hold fast, you will waver. What does the word waver mean? The word wavering is a form of the Greek word klino. <laughs> Listen to this. It means to bow down, to slope the shoulders, to bend over, or even to go to bed. It means to give up, to yield, to bend, to give ground to and it is the very word in the New Testament translated or be, as bed 
or pallet that one sleeps on. And it literally means if you don't hold fast, the dream thieves of life will get to you, including neutrality, which is your own personal problem that you have to overcome by crucifying your flesh, grabbing hold of the power of the Holy Spirit. But if you don't deal with it, you'll end up wavering, which means you'll get so exhausted, so exasperated, you'll slope your shoulders, you'll begin to bow low, say, somebody please give me a chair. I'm so tired of standing in faith. Oh, this chair is not enough. Somebody give me a bed and you'll go to bed on your faith. Do not go to bed on your faith. Don't do it. Don't do it. We're told in Philippians 1, 6, being confident, being confident of this very thing, that he which began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews 10, verse 23, again, we're told, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? For he is faithful that promised. Your due season is coming your way. And if you will stand in faith and if you will abide in patience, these are twins. This is a marriage made in heaven. When faith and patience are working together, they always produce the promises of God. And if you're the one who says, well, why should I just keep waiting, waiting, waiting? Because the end of Hebrews verse chapter 10, verse 23 says, he is faithful that promise. God is going to do exactly what he says he'll do. He just needs you to stay in faith and in patience until you receive. I'll be back in just a moment and I want to pray for you. Many people start out with a God-given dream and a passion to see that word from the Lord fulfilled in their lives. But the longer it takes for the dream to come to pass, the less their hearts burn for it until sadly they release God's dream for their lives altogether, letting it slip out of their hearts and hands and into oblivion. You need to know as you pursue your dream that you'll encounter dream thieves that will try to steal the dream from your heart. And in this 10-part series, Dream Thieves, Rick Renner will show you how to identify these dream thieves and how to overcome each of them. In this series, you'll learn how to hold fast to the dream God put in your heart, how to identify dream thieves that come to steal your dream, how to come into divine alignment with God's plan for your life, how to take steps to fulfill your dream. This practical and helpful 10-part series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $20. In addition, we're also offering you the 254-page book, Dream Thieves, for $15. As you read this book, God's purpose for your life will be so stirred up in you that you'll put questions and fears aside and begin to aggressively pursue what God has been telling you to do. Don't miss these exciting offers, the series Dream Thieves and the updated book Dream Thieves. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. In a culture where Santa seems to overpower the reason for the season, it's time to return to the true meaning of Christmas. In Rick Renner's timeless new book, Christmas, The Rest of the Story, Rick uncovers the stunning details of the nativity story you have never heard. Details like who exactly was Joseph, the father of Jesus? Why did God choose Mary? What was the star that guided the wise men? Who were the wise men who came to see Jesus? How far did they travel? And what was the value of the gifts they brought to Christ? Through its detailed watercolor illustration, Christmas the Rest of the Story invites families to explore the true meaning of Christmas as they interact with the story across decorated pages in a coffee table size format. When you call or go online right now to pre-order this book for just $35, you will receive the eternal story of Christmas, now beautifully told in this timeless keepsake. This is a sweeping portrait of the Christmas story, allowing readers to reflect on why Jesus came at the dawn of the first century and ultimately the reason for his birth. With stunning illustrations and nearly 300 pages, your family can create a tradition that will last for generations. Great as a gift or enhancing your own traditions, pre-order the book today. Christmas, the rest of the story for just $35. Call now or go to renner.org to order. Don't miss this special Christmas offer. This is Rick Renner and my friends right now, we're in the very middle of our ministry expansion project. It's three phases. Phase one was building the new studio in Moscow. You helped us do that. 
thank you. Phase two was finishing the interior of the studio. You helped us do that, thank you. Now we're in phase three, which is retiring the debt on the ministry headquarters in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Our ministry has never had debt. The reason we've been able to do what we've done is because we've never had to service debt. When we built our building in Riga, we did it cash. When we built the building in Moscow, it is amazing that we were able to do it with cash. And now we want to retire the debt on the Tulsa headquarters building so we can liberate all that money to really take the teaching of the Bible around the world. You know, it's never about buildings. It's about having an anchor where the Word of God can go forth. And in that Tulsa facility, we're taking calls from people who are literally calling us from all over the world. And from that facility, we're producing TV programs, social media, we're fulfilling orders for books and giving away thousands and thousands of different resources to people who are reaching out to us because they believe that we provide teaching they can trust. And it's very important that we retire that debt as quick as possible because it will liberate funds for the preaching of the word to the ends of the earth. And that is what we're called to do. And today I want to ask you to please continue to be a part of our giving team so we can retire the debt on the Tulsa building and then we'll be finished with the ministry expansion project. Thank you for your prayers and thank you for becoming a part of the giving team. Today, while I've been speaking to you, I've sensed that many of you need prayer. You're standing in faith, but you're tired and you need spiritual fortitude. Would you give us a call or send us an email? Let us know how we can pray for you and we'll pray for the power of the Holy Spirit just to give you all the strength and all the stamina you need to maintain your ground until you have received what God has promised to you. But give us a call or send us an email and we will immediately begin to pray for you. And when you reach out to us, be sure to order your series called Dream Thieves, Overcoming Obstacles to Fulfill Your Dreams. It comes with a wonderful study guide and it comes with a book by the same title. And I've been teaching from this book. And again, this book is not a theoretical exercise. This was born right out of my own life. As Denise and I and our sons and our ministry have learned to overcome many, many dream thieves that have tried to stop us. But we've learned that if you're determined and if you're willing to do whatever God tells you to do, you can push through every obstacle and step into the very thing God said he wanted to do in your life. But you've got to partner with God to do it. And it takes faith and it takes patience. Both of these always give birth to the promise of God. But Father, I thank you that you tell us that through faith and patience, we inherit the promises. Help us to believe and help us to stay in faith for as long as it takes until we see the manifestation of what you've said you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Hey, I'll be back tomorrow, but remember Ecclesiastes 8-4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Thank you for joining Rick Renner today. For more information about Renner Ministries and product resources, visit renner.org and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you enjoyed this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.